Ladies and gentlemen, uh, John Buckingham is our next speaker. Uh, he's going to be talking about myth debunking. The financial press can be hazardous to your wealth. So he's going to be talking probably about fake news. Um, John Buckingham is the CIO of the AFAM division of Kovitz Investment Group. He joined AFAM Capital in 1987 and Kovitz Investment Group in 2018 when it was part of the Kovitz acquisition of AFAM. Mr. Buckingham has more than 30 years of investment management experience and serves as the editor of the Prudent, Specular, the Prudent Speculator newsletter, which has been trusted for more than 40 years. He chairs the AFAM Investment Committee, leading a team that performs comprehensive investment research and financial market analysis. And Mr. Buckingham has been featured in Barron's, The Wall Street Journal, Forbes, and frequently contributes to CNBC, Bloomberg, and Fox News. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome John Buckingham. Thank you. Well, thank you all for having me on such a momentous day. It's always nice to follow Steve Forbes. Um, I do speak on the Forbes investment cruises, um, and I get to follow Steve then as well. So here's a commercial and a plug for those. I, I will be on the next couple of cruises if you want to have a wonderful time at sea, see great uh, folks, and uh, learn uh, more about how to uh, invest your portfolios. Uh, Aaron mentioned that, you know, I published the Prudent Speculator newsletter, and the Prudent Speculator has a fantastic long-term return. But we buy a broadly diversified portfolio of undervalued stocks, and we hold them for their long-term potential. That sounds boring, right? It's not, not exciting as the alert I just got on my phone today from CNN.com that says U.S. stocks have their worst day in months as the trade war with China escalates. So our problem as investors is that we're bombarded with so much information out there. We live in a, a world where so many people want to sell you something, want to get ratings. And not to pick on uh, CNBC, because they do have me on their airwaves sometimes, but uh, the top uh, picture there is of Jim Cramer. Remember the flash crash. You know, the world was ending. Well, look where the Dow was then, you know, 9,000 or so. Look at the magazine covers. You know, Ebola is coming. We remember Ebola? You know, it sort of uh, came and went before uh, Bloomberg could get their magazine in our mailboxes, given the publication uh, schedule. And then The Economist had the Acropolis now about the uh, Greek uh, debt crisis and the European financial crisis. But if you look, and you say, okay, well, The Economist, that's a very smart publication. You know, maybe I better get out of equities back in 2010. Believe it or not, that's when the Greek debt crisis peaked, or got started, I should say. It didn't even peak, it just got started. It hasn't peaked yet. We're still not out of the woods yet. But look how well stocks have done since then. So the moral of the story is if you fear and if you let fear uh, dictate your investment decisions, chances are you're not going to do very well in the market. Look back at 2016, same kind of thing. We had The Economist, again, telling us that the, the, we were out of ammunition. The U.S. economy was heading south. And it was, again, a scary time in the markets. The Wall Street Journal front page told us that there was uh, trouble brewing. And, of course, the trouble was brewing um, because we went through one of those inevitable market declines. And we can see what's happened since that Wall Street Journal piece in February 11th. Equities have risen substantially since then. So the moral of the story is that you want to stay the course through thick and thin. When days like today happen, you want to keep in mind that they've happened before. So anybody know how many times the Dow has fallen 2.38% in its history, going back to the 1920s? 50. Somebody said 50. 493 times we have had declines of magnitude equal to or greater than today's decline. So this is, you know, 2 point, 700 point or 600 points as it ended up being today. Those are not very, <laughs> it wasn't a good day, let's put it that way. But they happen, they've happened before and they will happen again. 
So the slide I have up there now shows all of the frightening events that we've overcome, really, uh, just since the 1940s. You know, the Cuban Missile Crisis, Kennedy assassinated, Nixon resigns, 9-11, all sorts of events have occurred, and yet stocks have proven themselves to be the place to be over the long haul. So again, the moral of the story is that you want to stay invested through thick and thin. And perhaps the best thing we could hope to see from the financial media is something like what's on this screen here. Because on uh, the day after Christmas, the mainstream media decided that it was time to talk about the big declines in the stock market. So if you see on CBS or NBC or those sorts of things, feature stories on the stock market and how, far, how poorly it's done, that's probably a buy signal for you. And if you look at the, the small print down there, it was essentially saying that now's the time to protect your portfolio. After we've gone down 20% is not the time to protect your portfolio, right? The time to protect it would have been before you went down 20% if somehow you could have predicted that. But that's not what the financial media is all about. And it's very important to understand that markets are volatile. We have seen significant volatility here recently, but over the history of the modern history of the equity markets. Believe it or not, 5% declines, we're now in another 5% decline, they happen on average twice a year. 10% declines happen on average more than once a year. Bear markets, 20% declines happen every 3.4, 3.5 years. So volatility is normal. You have to accept that. And I haven't figured out a way yet to avoid the volatility. You know, our investment newsletter, The Prudent Speculator, has a fantastic long-term track record. And we've called precisely zero of the market downturns. There's no way to predict them. But what the key is, is to stay invested so you can get those long-term returns, which have been very good over time of 9 to 13% in equities, depending on whether you invest in value stocks or growth stocks. So stocks will prove rewarding for you, provided you have the patience to stick with them. There will be ups and downs, but the long-term trend historically has been up. And it's been up um, you know, by a wide <laughs> margin over time. And those two uh, charts of the S&P 500 are essentially the same. They just have a different scale. One is a log scale and one is a regular scale. So the regular one on the top, it shows that there's been only a couple of downturns in history, right? It's sort of been straight up and then here recently we've had some volatility. But over time, as you can see in the bottom slide, or the bottom chart, there have been plenty of periods where we've had uh, volatility. The challenge for most people is that they get scared after we've gone down significantly and they don't get excited or want to invest again until we've gone up again. And market history shows that investors are awful market timers. So a study that was done here recently, it's done every year by Dalbar, shows the effects of lousy market timing. And investors have underperformed the in, by investing in mutual funds, they've underperformed the funds themselves and the S&P 500 by a wide margin because they buy high and they sell low. So the secret to success in stocks is not to get scared out of them. It's not my quote, but I like to say it a lot. It's, it's true. And how do you do that? How do you not get scared out of stocks? Well, you have data. You know, we, we crunch a lot of numbers. I mentioned the, the you know, 493 times we've gone down 2.38% in a day. Because those, those big numbers that you hear from the media, you know, oh my gosh, Dow down 700 points. That sounds huge, right? I mean, how can 1987, when I started in this business, we had a little 520 some odd point decline in the Dow. The problem was that back then it was 22%. <laughs> it wasn't 2.4% or so. So you want to actually crunch data, look at numbers, and don't necessarily believe everything that you hear. It doesn't mean that you don't have to be afraid, right? As I love this quote, fear cannot be banished, but it can be calm and without panic. It can be mitigated by reason and evaluation. And that's what we try to do, is to apply actual math and look at what has happened historically, rather than 
listening to the talking heads on TV. You know, last year we heard uh, earlier in the year from John Bogle, uh, rest in peace, uh, Mr. Bogle, um, he was on CNBC telling investors that at that time that we were in the most volatile market environment he had ever seen in his investment career. And he had been around for 60 some odd years. So nobody challenged him on this. They just said, okay, well, Mr. Bogle says it, it must be, so I'm going to believe that. And in reality, it wasn't true. Well, it's pretty fine. Okay. Um, Somehow it says they have five minutes. Um, we actually look at the data. And when you did that, you could see that stocks had been far more volatile in many different periods here recently. So again, don't believe everything you hear. We also hear uh, from uh, some folks who try to scare investors by saying, oh my gosh, you could have 25 years or 16 years where stocks go nowhere. And what they recite is Dow Jones Industrial Average numbers. So the Dow went essentially nowhere from 1966 to 1982 in terms of the actual index. But the index doesn't include dividends. And as people know, we like dividends. And then the impact of the dividends reinvested. So you can see that the Dow actually, while the index itself went nowhere, believe it or not, the returns for stocks were very good. Value stocks made 13% a year during that time span. So again, be very careful with those headlines. Same thing happened from 1929 to 1954. It took 25 years for the Dow to get back to where it started in terms of the index, but the dividends and the impact of their reinvestment uh, would have resulted in very good, not fantastic, but very good returns over that time span of seven to 8% per year. So don't believe everything you hear. And one of my favorite things or pet peeves is this idea that the bull market began in 2009. Anybody believe the bull market began in 2009? Nobody in the audience, excellent. So we can skip over all these slides. <laughs> well, it's true because the bull market did not begin in 2009. The bull market began on December 24th or 26th of last year because we had a bear market of 20%. And I know that most people don't believe that in terms of the media and the financial experts because they only look at closing prices. So we were only down 19.6% or so on a closing basis. But intraday, we were down more than 20%. And you can't see this, I know, in the back, but the average stock was down more than 20% during that time span. And if you still don't buy my argument, you can't deny when CNBC tells us we were in a bear market, right? Because they did. <laughs> they said we were in a bear market. They put it on their screen. These are screenshots from CNBC about the 2018 bear market. The interesting thing is that there's only one journalist out there that I know of who actually agrees with me that the, bull, the, bear, the bear market occurred last year and the bull market began in December, and that's a gentleman named Mark Holbert who I happen to think is the finest journalist in the land, primarily because he rates investment newsletters and he rates us very highly. But Mark is, Mark is very, uh, very astute and actually does the same kind of stuff we do, which is crunch numbers. And if you do that, you will see that there was indeed a bear market. The other thing we hear about here lately is that either low interest rates are going to be a problem or the inverted yield curve is gonna be a problem or rising interest rates are gonna be a problem. So no matter what, interest rates are going to somehow be a problem for investors. And again, market history will show, and even recent history, that low bond yields are not bad, unless you're investing in German you know, boons, which have a negative yield. So since the German boon went below zero in terms of its yield, which somehow signaled that the global economy was in distress, stocks have appreciated significantly with the S&P rising, well, close to 40% before today's decline. So again, if you sold stocks because interest rates were going lower and that meant that the economies around the world were tanking, that would have been a mistake. There's also been a lot of talk lately about yield curve inversion and somehow that being a harbinger of recession. Again, market history will show that it hasn't proven to be the case in terms of being a lousy 
environment for equities. So stocks have done okay uh, one year, three years, five years out when the yield curve has inverted. And the same thing for uh, Fed funds rate. Um, if you go back to when the Fed actually started raising rates in 2015, that was supposed to be fatal for equities. Well, that didn't prove to be the case. And so uh, we really think that interest rates are actually a positive for stocks. Think about the yields on your investment portfolios. Our portfolios are yielding about 3% in terms of our managed account strategies. Well, the, the yield you're getting on a 10-year treasury is what, 2.4% today? Even on a 30-year treasury, it's 2.8%. So stocks remain very attractive relative to bonds uh, because of the very low interest rate environment we're in. And a couple more, and I know I'm running out of time, but folks are not too optimistic about stocks. This is one I, I struggle with when I hear that everybody's bullish. I haven't seen it. We've seen mutual fund outflows, ETF outflows out of equities and into bonds here for the last few years. So investors are not super positive about stocks. If anything, they're actually negative in regard to stocks. And this, this shows you uh, fund flows from 2015. Some $700 billion went into bond funds and some 300, and I can't, my eyesight's a little bad there, some 350 billion have gone out of stock funds. So this idea that everybody's bullish, that's just not true. And so one of my favorite quotes is this one, if you do not change direction, you may end up where you are heading. I think it's very important for investors to have a long-term plan and to stick with it through thick and thin and not be uh, uh, caught off or get off course as a result of short-term market movements. Um, I think I'm about out of time, but I did want to let folks know that I do have a full presentation tomorrow called The Value of Dividends. It's in the Skyview room at 6 o'clock. I will have specific investment uh, recommendations there, our favorite dividend-paying value stocks that we'll, we'll talk about. Um, Aaron mentioned three stocks, uh, Apple, Caterpillar, and Boeing. Um, and I know that you came for stock picks, so I will tell you the yes, yes, and not yet in that order. So we do like Apple, we do like Caterpillar, um, and Boeing is something that we might look at if we can get a, a further decline. So I know that was rushed, but I do hope you come out at 6 o'clock uh, tomorrow. I do have a couple of folks here with me, uh, Eric and Chris. They're around, so please uh, check them, them out if you have any interest in what I had to say. Thank you very much.